This brief lecture will introduce you to the concepts of theories and hypotheses and how they're used in psychological science. Some of this material is covered by Jackson in chapter one, but a lot of the material either isn't specifically covered in your textbook or it might be scattered throughout subsequent chapters. So what I've tried to do is to collect it here as well as to provide a little bit more detail than may be available there. Now there are several different types of guiding principles that we use in psychological science. Now the terms you're going to be familiar with, but the thing to realize is that the way that we use these terms in science broadly might be a little bit different or more precise than it is used in conventional use in everyday language. So first of all, we think about theories, and we use this word all the time, but what we mean in science by a theory is a set of global summarizing statements. These exist at the most general level and allow us to make useful predictions in psychology about subsequent behaviors. Now an important point in the definition you see on the slide here is that they organize existing knowledge. What this means is that rarely are theories created sort of out of the blue or after just a couple observations, but rather what they're intended to do is to sort of unify or think about after a uh, a set of studies have been done, sometimes decades of research has been done, a way to organize the knowledge and the behavior that we've amassed and to think about how we might best explain that behavior or state it in a very general way. Now a great example from social psychology of a theory is Ashton and Fishbein's theory of, of reasoned action or planned behavior. And this says that a behavioral intention is going to be based off of our perceptions or beliefs about the situation as well as social norms and perceived behavioral control that we might have in the situation. So from these very general principles then what we can do is to generate some very specific testable claims that are going to be based off of these really very general types of statements. Now this is a verbal description or statement but what we can also do is to make this a little bit more formal. In fact Asgen has extended the theory and, and developed it as a formal mathematical model whereby we can plug in values for things like our uh, our current beliefs, our expected beliefs, social norms, and perceived control, and these sorts of things, and generate predictions about somebody's behavioral intentions in a situation. In this sense, we might refer to it more as a model than a theory. Now, I know the distinction between the two is, is somewhat subtle, and again, there might even be disagreement, depending on who you ask, whether something is a theory or a model. Models are analogies intended to capture the essence of these phenomena. Now, an important characteristic of, to realize about models is we know that all models are false. Just like a model airplane doesn't really fly, it's not useful for engaging in flight, but it does help us to understand the workings of the airplane if it's an accurate model. Similarly, in psychology, behavioral science, and science more broadly, models are indeed useful analogies that we can use to make predictions about different variables that are involved in the theory. Now, even though it's hard to tell the two apart, one heuristic way to, to think about it is that theories are typically described as a series of verbal statements, whereas models are more often than not described quantitatively and allow a little bit greater level of precision in that sense. Another typically quantitative type of descriptive tool in psychology is a law. Now, laws are few and far between, especially when we're talking about human behavior but they describe the type of regular relationships that you would expect to find and that yield relatively consistent, robust, and precise types of predictions. And psychophysics is where we encounter an, uh, a number of laws that have stood the test of time, such as Weber's law, which relates the, the objective stimulus to the subjective perception that, that, that one finds in the brain. In particular, it talks about things like uh, the fact that if you hold a match outside on a bright day, the brightness of that match doesn't seem to be as bright as if you hold the same match in a dark room or a dark cave or something of that sort, right? So the difference, the increase in brightness of just lighting one match depends on the brightness of the surrounding context. Now, those types of predictions in that specific relationship is formulated quantitatively by Weber's law and other extensions thereof. Another example is the yerkes dotson law. This suggests that arousal produces sort of a, a bell-shaped uh, response on performance or influence on one's performance. Okay, in particular, at very low levels of arousal, one isn't motivated or aroused enough to, to perform well on a specific task. Now, as you slowly increase arousal, that people uh, achieve optimal performance at moderate levels of arousal. In that situation, 
you're under enough pressure or under enough arousal motivation to perform a task well, so you're not bored with the task. Yet you're also not so highly aroused that it starts to impair your performance. However, at high levels of arousal, as you increase further to the right on the graph here, now what you see is performance decrements as associated with this increase in arousal. That is, now you're so strung out that you're not doing well on the task because you have such a high level of stress or arousal. Okay? Now this type of relationship, again, can be quantified and expressed mathematically, and it, again, it's come to be known as, as the yerkes dodson law of, of, of arousal and the effects on performance. Now from any of these different types of guiding principles, what we can then do is to generate specific hypotheses. Now, the main difference between the previous three types of principles and hypotheses are that hypotheses are very specific. That is, they are questions about specific patterns of behavior or relationships for certain situations. So you might have hypotheses for a specific instance or a specific situation that's generated from the theories or models that we have above. So if you go back to the Ashton and Fishbein model of reasoned action or planned behavior, then based on a specific situation, we can think about whether a persuasive message, for example, might be influential. Or we might be able to predict what somebody might do given very specific conditions about social conventions, whether or not they feel that they're in control of, of their behavior and of the situation, their current beliefs, and so forth and so on. So again, these four different terms here, theories, models, laws, and hypotheses, are going to be important and they're going to be used over the course of the semester and you're going to encounter them all the time in the types of readings that you're doing in the psychological literature so it is important to understand the role that each one might play. Now, now that we know about theories and hypotheses as well as models and laws it's important also to understand characteristics of good theories and hypotheses. Okay? And that is we want to generate hypotheses and we want to use theories that exhibit some specific characteristics. The first of these is that they're productive or generative. Now all that simply means is a theory is no good if it doesn't generate different hypotheses. If it completely describes behavior and doesn't allow us to generate new predictions about novel behaviors, then even though it might be a sound theory, it's not good or useful in the sense that it's not getting us anywhere new. So being productive and being able to generate new predictions is important for a theory. We know that any theory has to be testable and our hypotheses have to be testable as well. This is again something we talked about early on, so I'm not going to go into a lot of additional detail here, but it's important to recognize this is an important characteristic of our hypotheses. We have to be able to have the means to test the types of hypotheses that we're making. If something isn't test testable, or it's not falsifiable specifically, then it's not going to be of much use to us. So again, recall our discussion during week two of this course and some of the material in chapter one about the importance of generating hypotheses and making claims that are indeed not only testable, that we can see whether or not that we, we might be able to, to find support for or against it, but also falsifiable. That is, we won't find support for the behavior in every instance. Now finally, one that we haven't talked about yet is important, is parsimony. Now what parsimony simply says, and you might have uh, heard this referred to in, in a philosophy course in another context as Occam's Razor, is parsimony is looking for simple explanations to different phenomena. So in other words, if we have two different competing theories, and they both equally explain a certain behavior, or they both explain a certain behavior equally well, then we want to give a little bit of, of, of credit, if you will, or a bit of an advantage to the explanation that's simpler. Now, a great example of this, even though it's not from behavioral science, is actually from astronomy. Okay, so this cute guy over here, Ptolemy, introduced a theory about planetary motion, okay, and in particular, the structure of the universe. Okay, and this was a theory that put the Earth at the center of the universe. And for a long, long time, this was the most prevailing theory. This was a theory uh, to which everybody prescribed and that everybody believed. Yet a lot of the observations, a lot of the data started to question or call into question this theory. That is, it didn't seem that some of the observations, for example, some of the orbits that, that, um, uh, that, that, they, that astronomers observed in the planets really fit in with a model of having the Earth as the center. So some of the things just didn't make sense. So what people had to do, Ptolemy had to do, was to introduce a number of devices 
And so what it, it ended up being sort of a patchwork theory that ultimately took 30 different books to fully explicate this theory in order to account for a lot of the observed data. Well, then another looker, Copernicus, comes along, and he comes up with a much simpler explanation. He simply said, well, wait a minute, what if the Earth isn't the center of the universe? If the Sun is the center of the universe, this provided a much more elegant and a much simpler explanation for the exact same observations. In other words, it didn't take 30 books. Sure, it still took like six chapters of a book to explain, but it was a much simpler explanation and one that we know today to actually be the correct explanation okay, or description of the universe. The point here, however, is how even though they were both able to explain the observations, okay, Copernicus's theory was much more parsimonious, and for that reason it was favored over Ptolemy's theory alone. Okay. Uh, another wonderful scientist in another butte, Einstein, perhaps said it best that everything should be as simple as possible, but not one bit simpler. Okay, And that's something to keep in mind when we're developing theories as well. Rather than having some largely contrived theory with a bunch of different devices and a bunch of, uh, of different um, uh, parts that all need to work together intricately, okay? A, a simple explanation is often the best explanation. That is the rule of parsimony when we're talking about theories and hypothesis building.